This program is brought to you by Emory University. Well, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and welcome to our Law and Religion Forum. It's a great privilege to have all of you here. Thank you so much for coming. My name is John Witte. I serve as director of the Center for the Study of Law and Religion here at Emory University, the sponsor of our forum today. Our center is dedicated to unpacking some of the deep religious sources and dimensions of hard issues of law, politics, and society. We work with some 95 faculty from around the campus and some 1,600 scholars from around the world. We sponsor advanced research projects and publications, senior fellowships, clinical internships, specialized courses and degree programs, and a variety of public forums such as this one. This afternoon, we begin a year-long series of lectures on the plight of the deeply needy and the deeply vulnerable amongst us. Their plight has become more urgent in our day. For better or for worse, the modern welfare state as we know it is crumbling under massive global economic pressure, military conflict, bureaucratic inefficiency, and soaring debt. The social welfare net is fraying. Vital services for the poor, the needy, the deeply vulnerable, the poor, the widows, the orphans amongst us are being slashed precipitously on both sides of the Atlantic. We've seen the first waves of state and local and national insolvency of Western governance. This will likely worsen with the most vulnerable of society feeling the strongest blows. This is not apocalypse mongering or state bashing. The government will survive, but at least for the next generation or two, that government will be diminished in its capacity to care for the least amongst us. Starting today, we'd like to begin an open, public, and earnest conversation together about creative new ways that we can think about providing the least of society with more effective support from those of us who've been privileged to receive more. How can religious and cultural communities, families and domestic networks, private schools and charities, private enterprise and nonprofits, local NGOs and international agencies, creatively ally with government and with each other in the vindication of the first, second, and third generation rights of all of its citizens? This topic has been the special concern of our two speakers that we have slated for today, Professor Martha Albertson Feynman, the Robert W. Woodruff Professor of Law, and the founder and director of the world famous Feminism and Legal Theory Project, and Professor Barbara Bennett Woodhouse, LQC Lamar Professor of Law, faculty advisor to our storied Barton Child Law and Policy Center, directed by Professor Melissa Carter. Professor Feynman has, alas, taken rather seriously ill, and she sends her rather deep regrets, very deep regrets, and we send her Godspeed in hoping that she'll recover soon. We will post her full paper on our center website, and we will get a taped lecture for her when she can speak again, and post that on our center website too, so we can have the benefit of her deep reflections on these issues of vulnerability. Professor Woodhouse, our second speaker, uh, is kind enough to deliver a brief precy of Professor Feynman's paper. But it's a special privilege to welcome Professor Woodhouse in her own right, as this year's Don S. Browning lecturer on issues of religion and the family. Professor Woodhouse is one of the nation's and indeed one of the world's leading scholars and advocates of family law and especially the law relating to children and children's need and children's welfare. She was educated at Columbia and UPenn and UVA and various other places around the world. She clerked for Justice Sandra Day O'Connor of the United States Supreme Court before embarking on a distinguished career as a scholar and a teacher and an advocate. She has briefed and argued several dozen important state and federal cases, especially on issues of children, and published some five dozen major articles. She held distinguished professorships at the University of Florida and the University of Pennsylvania before we spirited her away and she joined us here at the Emory Law School faculty in 2009. And this was just in time for us to witness the publication of her brilliant award-winning title, Hidden in Plain Sight, The Tragedy of Children's Rights from Ben Franklin to Lionel Pate, published by Princeton University Press copies outside for your perusal and purchase, and it just 
brilliant, brilliant read, which I commend very warmly to you. The American Bar Association has named her a human rights hero. Probably should be heroine, but nonetheless. Her many students and colleagues and admirers here at Emory have known her for the heroism of her work each day on behalf of the most voiceless and voteless and vulnerable amongst us, our little children. We'll get a little look into her great work uh, on this theme in her Don S. Browning lecture today, Blessing Vulnerability, Building Resilience, Children, Church, and Community. Will you please join me in welcoming our teacher, our colleague, our mentor, our friend, Professor Barbara Bennett Woodhouse as the Don Browning Lecture. Well, that was a very generous uh, and eloquent uh, opening for this session, and I thank you very much for your kind comments. It's quite an honor for me to stand here not only speaking to you about my own work, but I'm the voice this this afternoon of Martha Feynman, a dear friend and colleague and a role model for me throughout my career. I know she would very much like to be here, but she has lost her voice, literally. And here I am to uh, give you some of the uh, thoughts and, and musings that she had prepared for us today. She and I have both been very much involved in this new vulnerability initiative. And so the opportunity to give a joint lecture was one that we both welcomed very much. Uh, and my remarks that I had prepared very much depend on an understanding of her philosophy, her theory of vulnerability and the human condition. So I'm going to now read you some uh, remarks that she prepared for us. Her full uh, speech will be available uh, in the future, but these should set the stage and give you a good idea of, of what we're working on in the vulnerability initiative. The Vulnerability and the Human Condition Initiative brings together scholars interested in exploring the concepts of human vulnerability and resilience and their implications for building a more responsive state. The fundamental questions that motivate the initiative are, first, what does it mean to be human? How do we imagine the human being and the human condition? Second. How should that image of humanity inform politics and law? The first question, what it means to be human, is certainly also relevant to world religions and is implicit in the methodologies and approaches of academic disciplines, as diverse as ethics and economics, as well as philosophy, political theory, and sociology. Unlike these other disciplines, and alike religion, Vulnerability theory places human dependency and vulnerability at the center of the inquiry into what it means to be human. It also rejects the division of the world into public versus private spheres and the designation of the private family as the repository for dependency. It is this privatization that facilitates the idea that the state should be restrained should not interfere with the liberty and autonomy of individuals. This challenge that the vulnerability approach poses to other academic and political paradigms can be summed up in an additional question. If bodily needs, desires, and yearnings, and the messy dependency they often carry with them cannot be ignored in life, how can they be marginalized, sequestered, or absent in our theories about society, economics, justice, politics, and law. Here are some key concepts and definitions in vulnerability theory. First, vulnerability is a universal and constant aspect of the human condition. It arises from our embodiment in the first instance and from our subsequent location within society and its institutions. On the individual level, vulnerability refers to the ever-present possibility of harm, injury, or biological impairment or limitation. But the concept of vulnerability applies beyond the biological 
As human creations, our institutions are also vulnerable. They are prone to capture, co-optation, and corruption. Significantly, neither the bodily nor the institutional manifestation of human vulnerability can be eliminated completely. Though individuals and society can take measures to mitigate or ameliorate harm. Vulnerability should not only be equated with injury or harm, however. Properly understood, our human vulnerability is also understood as being generative and presenting opportunities for innovation and growth, creativity and fulfillment. As embodied and vulnerable beings, we experience feelings such as love, respect, curiosity, amusement, and desire that make us reach out to others, form relationships, and build institutions. Both the negative and the positive possibilities inherent in vulnerability recognize the inescapable interrelationship and interdependence that mark human existence. Secondly, the vulnerable subject is a reconceptualized legal entity that is meant to replace the autonomous and independent liberal subject that currently is at the center of law, politics, and policy discussions. The liberal subject, at best, captures only one stage within that life course, the least likely to recognize the inevitability of dependency or reflect the vulnerability of the human condition. And this one-dimensionally liberal subject with its asserted autonomy, self-sufficiency, and independence has been used to render as pathological and deviant what are natural and inevitable relationships of dependency and need. By contrast, the idea of a vulnerable subject recognizes human experience a wide variety of circumstances over the course of a lifetime. We are beings who are born, live, and die within a fragile materiality that renders all of us constantly susceptible to internal and external forces that are often outside our control. These circumstances necessitate that an individual possess a wide range of differing and in interacting abilities, including the ability to access other individuals and institutions and the resources they can provide. When it is placed at the center of political and social endeavors, the vulnerable subject can expand our ideas about what constitutes state responsibility by focusing on the role of the state and its institutions in providing the resources that give us resilience. Third, resilience is a highly relational concept emphasizing the importance of understanding individuals within institutions and in interactions with each other. Resilience is the counterpoint to vulnerability. Significantly, when we understand vulnerability, we realize that invulnerability is impossible to achieve and folly to pursue. The state and the societal institutions it brings into existence through law, collectively play an important role in generating resilience. Together and independently, institutional systems, such as those of education, finance, and health, provide the resources necessary for resilience in the face of our vulnerability. Resources can come in material forms, such as accumulated wealth. They are also present in social goods, such as relationships and ties within families or social networks, as well as in the human capital that comes from education or training. These resources are accumulated and dissipated over time, in the course of a lifetime, in the process of making decisions, responding and reacting to life's circumstances. At times of crisis or opportunity, our accumulated resources are what limits or enhances our so-called autonomy, allowing us to exercise agency since they define what are our realistic options. 
These resources cannot eliminate our inherent invulnerability, but they can and do mediate, compensate, and lessen the experience of vulnerability. In assessing resilience, it is important to understand that our experiences with institutions are often concurrent and interactive, but also can be sequential. For example, the relationship between the education system and the employment and social security system is sequential. Collectively, they provide for the accumulation of resources, creating assets for use in, present, in the present, and to preserve possibilities and opportunities for the future. Significantly, the failure of one system in a sequence, such as a failure to receive an adequate education, affects future prospects and often is impossible to fully compensate given that the systems further down the line are constructed in reliance on successfully fulfilling the earlier steps. Someone who misses out on education typically will have fewer options and opportunities in the workplace, which will make for a more precarious retirement and fewer savings. On the other hand, and also important, is the fact that sometimes privileges conferred in one concurrent system can comp compensate or even cancel out disadvantages encountered in others. For example, a good early start in regard to education, such as that provided by Head Start, may triumph poverty as a predictor of success later in school, particularly when coupled with the advantages of a social or relational system uh, that a social or relational system can provide, such as a supportive family and progressive social network. In other words, society's institutions interact in ways that actually produce or fail to produce social, political, and economic equality. They can confer privilege or disadvantage, and an initial privilege or disadvantage may determine if an individual is able to fully benefit from other systems. Further, because this is true, privileges and disadvantages are cumulative and thus have effects more profound than any single indicator of privilege or disadvantage. This focus on systems of institutions and the resources they can confer supplements attention to the individual subject, placing him and her in societal context and blurring the line between what is public versus private or individual responsibility. This blurring allows us to reconceptualize the nature of state responsibility by bringing into focus the social and economic role of institutions and using this to recalibrate our current overemphasis on individual responsibility. In addition, it is important to recognize that there is some institutional social responsibility. These institutions are heavily subsidized by society and benefit from the allocation of collective resources to them, whether that occurs in the form of tax policy or direct investment. These institutions, uh, because they are so important, both to individuals and to society, the flaws and barriers, gaps and potential pitfalls that such institutions contain must be monitored and adjusted when they are functioning in ways harmful to society. Further, the values that should guide the judgment of institutional operation must be democratic and publicly oriented, reflecting norms of equality and open access and shared opportunity. In conclusion, ultimately, orienting law and politics around the vulnerable subject would emphasize a different set of values than those that have evolved around the liberal subject and a restrained state. Those values would be more egalitarian and collective in nature, preferring connection and interdependence rather than autonomy and independence in both political and personal visions. In, co in contemporary political discourse, the image of the human being as both a legal reality and a political subject is reductive, diminished in both descriptive and aspirational terms. We are perversely individualized and isolated at the same time that we are cast as merely the subjects of balance sheets and statistical models. The asserted inevitability of our selfish nature 
captured in economic terms such as moral hazard, and the extent of our ambitions confined by the glorification of efficiency. Further harm is done to the common good when the state is perceived as a threat to liberty and autonomy, not as one of the necessary providers or issuers or insurers of the resources for resilience whereby individual agency can be realized. These are crabbed images that confine current political rhetoric and hobble the imagination of political and legal theorists. A vulnerability analysis asks us, and our philosophers and politicians, to embrace a more complex reality. So these are uh, the words of Martha Feynman, and uh, they provide a really fine introduction And I hope that, uh, that you will see this connections between the paper that I will be giving and these comments that you've just uh, heard that Martha provided for us today. My work tends to be uh, very much based in uh, everyday life and reality, so I will be using pictures. Uh, as we, the pictures that say a thousand words, I have a lot of pictures, so I hope you'll bear with me and, uh, and uh, um, think as we're working through this, this paper that I'm giving today about the resonance and interconnections between it and the uh, the whole concept of vulnerability theory, because it really does grow out of that. Martha's comments have provided an overview of vulnerability theory at the macro level. She paints in broad strokes the universality of vulnerability and the role of a responsive state in fostering resilience. Now I will be inviting you to look at vulnerability at the micro level. My talk examines one particular manifestation of vulnerability in ecological context. We will be looking at children through the lens of vulnerability theory. Let me be very clear. In focusing today on children, we are not arguing that children should be the winners in a competition for the prize as the most vulnerable. Vulnerability is not special. It is universal. At the same time, it must be studied in its particularity. Children are an obvious example of the universality and particular particularity of vulnerability. Some of us may be lucky enough never to be homeless, unemployed, or disabled, never to grow old or infirm. But all human beings, and indeed many non-human beings, enter life in a state of total dependency. It is remarkable that we survive at all. In this drama of the survival of the weakest and most defenseless, law and religion play important roles. Christianity, like many other religions, treats vulnerability as a state of blessedness rather than a state of failure. Today I will explore in a very specific context the role played by religious faith in fostering social solidarity across generations and in building resilience. Uh, and I'll be looking at childhood in one small community. This is the village of Scanno, which we'll be looking at in greater detail. Before beginning, let me say a word about resilience and childhood. Resilience in its most concrete form is the neurological wiring and chemical interactions in our brains that help us survive and thrive in the face of adversity. Gestation and early childhood are the most critical periods for human brain development. 
Recent studies using research tools such as longitudinal epidemiological data and brain imaging have established beyond question that resilience is not simply a static trait linked to genetic heritage. The capacity for resilience depends on physical and chemical interactions with caregivers and the environment during childhood that powerfully shape and sculpt our growing veins. The effects of neglect and isolation can be devastating to an infant. Brain scans comparing normal three-year-olds and three-year-olds raised in Romanian orphanages show how the lack of emotional nurturing stunts the development of otherwise healthy infants. The CDC's ACE study on adverse childhood experiences has documented on a huge scale how exposure to trauma in childhood makes us more vulnerable in adulthood to ills that range from heart attacks and diabetes to depression and alcoholism. The greater the number of adverse childhood experiences, the more severe the effect. Make no mistake, a society's capacity for resilience is not just born, it is also made. Resilience can be nurtured or sabotaged, depending on the social environments we create, especially those of infants and children. When I was invited to give the Brown Lecture, one part of my, uh, 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 one part of my Italian project, the role of the faith community in children's development, seemed an ideal match. Religion plays a central role in creating social norms that are translated directly or indirectly into laws and policies that shape the human ecosystem. Human ecosystems in common with natural ecosystems may be studied on a grand scale, as in climate change and the economics of globalization. But a system often can reveal more when studied on a very small scale. In my examination of the role of religion in shaping the ecology of childhood, I have chosen to start small with a relatively isolated community in which the faith community, here a Roman Catholic church, is the central feature of the social organization. Danno, population 1,966, the last time I checked, which was yesterday, they have a website, is located in central Italy in the mountain province of Aquila in the region of Abruzzo. Only three hours from Rome, but isolated from the world by narrow winding roads that climb through hand-hewn mountain passes, Scana was a settlement in pre-Roman times and has survived wars and foreign occupation, earthquakes, rock slides, depopulation, and countless other crises. Driving up the steep Sagittario Gorge, it takes an hour to travel the 20 kilometers between Scanno and the next town of any size. Many of its traditions remain intact. While the people of Scanno may be isolated by geography, they are now just a click away from modern culture, with cell phones in every pocket and televisions in every home. I spent the month of May 2012 in Scanno, visiting schools and community events, observing church services, chatting with children in the piazza, the town square, and interviewing people of all ages. Scanno gives us childhood in a Petri dish, allowing us to explore a simple community in all its complexity. Before describing what I observed in Scanno, let me introduce the ecological model I used to study childhood and explain how it maps the roles of law and religion. Developed by social scientists like Yuri Bronfenbrenner, this model may be new to lawyers, but it is a staple of research in child development. It situates the child in the center of various systems that affect his or her development in profound ways. Closest to the child are the microsystems in which the child actually lives, such as family, faith community, and school. For a very small child, the diagram of microsystems may look quite simple, but it grows in complexity as the child's world expands. 
Where microsystems overlap, we have mesosystems. Ideally, the child's microsystems are in relative harmony. But where conflict develops in the mesosystems, children will experience stress. Not all stressors are bad. And some exposure to difficulty can assist the child in developing resilience. For example, a child whose faith community is different uh, from that of his peers at school can thrive if the school climate is one of respect for religious diversity. And knowing him can teach his peers the values of tolerance. A child forced to deny his faith and his family's roots in order to be safe at school can suffer damaging levels of stress. Exosystems add another layer of complexity. They are places the child may never actually go, but that have great influence on the child's life. The parent's workplace is a good example. The child of a parent with a precarious hold on a low-paying job requiring mandatory overtime lives in a very different world from the child whose parent goes to a secure job paying a living wage and located in a family-friendly workplace that offers on-site daycare and flex time. The final element of the model is the macro system, defined as the culture of ideas and power, values, politics, prejudices, and the like. The macro system is more than a surface layer. My capacity to show you things in three dimensions is limited, but I assure you it's more than a surface layer. It permeates a particular society, much like water permeates an ecosystem. As with water, there's a continual exchange from micro to macro and back. To situate law in this model, law emanates from the macro system. We can think of the macro system as the wellspring of the values, norms, and power structures that are enacted into laws and policies. The ecological model has implications for vulnerability theory as a whole, not just for children. If we imagine Martha Feynman's vulnerable subject at the center of our ecological model, its relevance to the human condition is universalized. The question becomes whether we can transform our society so that it is more responsive to our shared vulnerability rather than driven by destructive myths of rugged individualism and survival of the fittest. Now you know my methods and motivation. Let me show you the first picture I took of Scanio. I was visiting this town one rather cloudy Sunday in May 2011, looking for sites to study childhood in poorer and more isolated regions of Italy, when I was struck by the number of children in the piazza. One of Italy's biggest problems right now is a low birth rate. In big cities, people complain that children have all but disappeared from public view. And here was a crowd of toddlers and children growing larger every minute. This piazza is called Santa Maria della Valle, St. Mary of the Valley, the same name as the parish church located here. It is at the center of town and provides a very child-friendly space with the church on one side, uh, and Asilo del Buon Pastore, or Good Shepherd Children's Nursery, on the other. The piazza is ringed with small cafes where grown-ups gather and benches where old people sit in the sun and enjoy being part of the life of the town. There is a bronze statue of a woman in traditional dress where the piazza gives onto a pedestrian street leading into a maze of stone houses connected by narrow cobbled alleys and stone stairways. Here children can play soccer, nurse their dolls, and ride bicycles in safety. By chatting with people in the piazza, I discovered that everyone was gathering for the first communion of the group of children age 11 and 12 who were reaching this religious milestone. The people I spoke with all said that the birth rate in Scano seemed to be doing fine, and rosettes of pink or blue ribbons signaling the births of babies were blooming regularly on doors of homes and businesses. I decided I had to come back and study Scanno. 
So the next day, I went to the mayor's office to find out where to begin. He was out, but the ladies there told me I should begin with the parish priest. Don Carmelo, after 30 years ministering to the Scanno flock, knew everything there was to know about the families of Scanno. Fortunately, Don Carmelo seemed pleased at my interest and encouraged me to come back the following year. The first place he sent me on my return in 2012 was the Asilo Buon Pastore, Good Shepherd Nursery. The name is especially appropriate for Scanno because from Roman times onward, sheep raised for their wool and their milk have been a central part of Scanno's economy. In the old days, as the seasons changed, the men and boys trekked long distances to pasture the flocks, leaving the women and girls in charge of the village for months at a time, cooking, chopping wood, spinning, weaving, and making lace for sale to the outside world. Asilo Buon Pastore was built around 1930 by a group of private citizens, but it serves the entire community, and the children have always been taught by an order of teaching nuns with guidance from the parish priest. Almost without exception, all children three to six attend Buon Pastore. Most have been cared for by mothers or grandmothers during their first 36 months of life, but they start school at three, even if they have a full-time caregiver at home. The school day begins before 9 a.m. and ends in late afternoon, and it includes a hot meal, three courses, eaten at child-sized tables with tablecloths and cutlery. I witnessed a, a very young group, three-year-olds, eating hot minestra soup without spilling a drop. Nutritious meals and educational activities are mandated by Italian education law. It is a setting intended to challenge the children intellectually, physically, and socially. While children run and climb and shout in the school play areas, they learn very early how to listen and concentrate when asked to complete a task. The teachers accomplish this without raising their voices or resorting to humiliating punishment. Italians were scandalized recently when a teacher in a city school punished naughty children by placing them in isolation, confining them inside a chalk rectangle drawn on the pavement of the school play playground during recess. And this was considered a real assault on their dignity. Italian education law has established princi the principle of parietaria, which is, translates equalization for religious and state-run schools, with a formula for determining appropriate rates of public subsidies for private religious schools, many of which predate, by centuries, the public establishments. However, Asilo Buon Pastore is always struggling to make ends meet while keeping its costs down and the teaching sisters are growing older and fewer. Technically, the government is supposed to identify children whose families are too poor to pay the modest tuition in order to provide subsidies. In practice, my informants told me that the money is always found somewhere, in the parish coffers or in the town coffers, without stigmatizing any child or family. Children all wear the same clothing at school, little track suits in primary colors, so no child stands out as richer or poorer. Schools are often bent to meet the special needs of individual children. For example, the sisters encouraged the mentally challenged mother of a two-year-old to enroll her child early because they knew the child needed stimulation and the mother needed respite and support. The sisters could not recall a single case in which a Scano child had to be removed from home because of neglect or abuse. When caregivers were overwhelmed, extended family and neighbors always pitched in to help, and it was easy to make a referral to special education services and to medical or mental health treatment paid for through the national health care system. A publicly funded religious school like this one would be unimaginable in the United States with our strict separation of church and state. Italy is different. Catholicism is no longer the state religion, but the roots of the Catholic tradition run very deep, especially in hospitals and schools. The Italian Constitution guarantees freedom of religion, 
And while religion is a subject taught in public schools, all children are free to study and practice their own faiths at school. But as I saw at Buon Pastore, and at, also in the Scano public schools, it is almost impossible to separate the school environment from the influence of the Catholic faith. With crucifixes on the schoolroom walls, religious art as a mainstay of the curriculum, and a calendar dominated by Catholic festivals. The European Court of Human Rights recently held that an Italian law requiring the display of the crucifix on public school walls, when understood in Italian cultural and historical context, did not infringe on parents or children's rights of religious freedom. One annual event illustrates the close integration of school, church, and community life beginning in children's infancy. Each spring, a tiny statue of the Madonna and child called La Madonnina del Lago, or the Little Madonna of the Lake, is brought in solemn procession from a lakeside chapel nearby, uh, and it is brought to the Buon Pastore nursery. The Madonnina stays in the nursery for over a month, and each night a different child can ask to take her home. This, this uh, we, we have this with gerbils in the United States. <laughs> well, the, the Madonnina is, is something that's very precious that the children take home and, of course, have to take very good care of. Um, the Madonnina stays in the nursery for over a month, and each night a different child may ask to take her home. On the feast day of the Madonna, the children leave the nursery school carrying the little carved statue on their shoulders much as the grown men of Scanno carry heavy wooden figures of saints through the streets on other saints' days. The procession of teachers and children is joined in the piazza by all the uh, town's infants and toddlers in carriages and strollers. Each child and each mother of an infant is given a long white calla lily to carry as they process through the town singing traditional songs that emphasize the lives of children and the, uh, the preciousness of children and the care for children. They're very focused on that, uh, that celebrating that relationship. After a winding journey through this village streets, with the whole town turned out to watch and take pictures with their cell phones, the procession finishes back at the parish church where the children place the statue in front of the altar. After a short homily from Don Carmelo about the preciousness of children as reflected in the Christ child, each child places his or her lily in a vase near the Madonnina and all go home a few hours early for dinner with their families. I don't know if you can see her, she's very small, but she's just sitting right above the calla lilies. So she's only about this tall. And the uh, sign there says, offerings for the people struck by earthquakes in the Abruzzo region. Now occasionally, the school population includes a non-Catholic child, mostly Muslims or Jehovah's Witnesses, and they may participate as part of the group or opt out of this ceremony if their parents prefer. Whatever its potential uh, for non-Catholics as an exclusionary performance, Given Scano's traditions and its demographics, the symbolism of the pr procession serves to bond the community to its children and reinforces public values of nurture and care. In a very real way, the public spaces of Scano belong to the children. Children play freely in the piazzas, in the streets, and in the flights of stone steps uh, that connect these steep streets uh, across the village. Kids, not cars, are kings. You can see the uh, do not enter sign. I can't imagine wanting to enter that on a vehicle. Um, parents feel secure, allowing even very young children to explore the physical environment, knowing that many adult eyes are watching over them. Scanno, like Italy, is aging rapidly. When someone in Scanno dies, Big Maria, the big bell in the church tower tolls to tell everyone that someone has passed. Recently, Don Carmelo instituted a new custom. 
He was tired of hearing the bells for tolling for death, and he wanted to hear a happier sound. Whenever a child is born, he has the sacristan ring Big Maria loudly and merrily, the way it does for major festivals, to let everyone know there is a new baby in town. So far, the births are keeping up with the deaths. Near the end of, end of my stay, I was having coffee in one of the cafes on the piazza when I was with this another impromptu procession that would be difficult to imagine in the United States. The public primary school, like the nursery school, had been studying a unit on the environment, timed to coincide with Italian celebrations of Earth Day. Ghana was a very environmentally conscious community, bordering as it does on the National Wildlife Refuge of the Abruzzo Mountains. Bears and wolves are regularly seen in and around Scano. On this day, the older children from the public primary school located down the hill had created posters about the environment, and they and their teachers processed with their signs and banners up the hill to the private Catholic nursery to spend an afternoon teaching the smaller children about ecology and the wilderness. The idea of bigger and stronger creatures caring for weaker and smaller creatures, and of nurturing connections between older and younger is reinforced in this and in many other ways. The Good Shepherd is more than a metaphor to scan those children. When asked to draw pictures of their families, they often include sheep, goats, chickens, and pigs that they are responsible for caring for. Reinforcing an ethic of care, children's values of human dignity and acceptance are nurtured through interactions with classmates who are different in physical and cognitive abilities and need their understanding and support. In the piazza, the aged and adults with disabilities are very visible and integrated into daily life in Scano as they are in most of Italy. Shortly before the end of May, it was time for the 2012 crop of children to make their first communion. This year, I knew many of the children of Scano by name, having visited their classrooms and attended their festivals and sports events. They knew me too, greeting me as La Professoressa when we met in the street. Ciao, Professoressa. If I happened upon the 2011 ceremony as an outsider, I attended the 2012 ceremony as an insider. A few days earlier, my husband and I had stopped at a mountain lodge in a high pass and had been chatting with the owner. On hearing of my research, he told us that he and his wife had adopted a brother and sister from an orphanage in the Ukraine through an Italian program linking adoptive families with children in need of homes. We showed pictures of our own adopted son, now grown, and shared stories of our experiences. According to this father, even though his children spoke no Italian when they arrived two years earlier at ages nine and 10, they had quickly become part of the fabric of school and community. Just then, his daughter ran into the room, came up to me shyly and asked, weren't you at our school last week? I recognized both children, not only from school, but from a recent children's event involving traditional songs and dances and prizes for the best poems written and declaimed in local dialect. On First Communion Sunday, the mothers and fathers gathered with the new communicants dressed in white at a medieval church on the far side of town. Preceded by a flock of altar boys in red, they formed a procession through the streets, another procession, through the streets of the village, with each child walking between his or her parents and holding their hand. Again, the whole town turned out. Here are the siblings from Ukraine, walking with their Italian mother and father. And here is Don Carmelo, ushering all into the church. During the ceremony, each child spoke some verses, and Don Carmelo delivered a homily, welcoming each child to the community, reminding the entire community of Scano that they were responsible for the welfare of these children and telling the children that now they were older, they must look after those younger and smaller. Again, the very public ceremony bonded all the children to the community, and the community pledged to care for all of them. 
During my last few days in Scanno, I began posing a particular question to all the adults I met. What do you think is the most important thing for creating a good environment for children? I heard a striking unanimity. From old men and young women, shopkeepers, teachers, the plumber, the butcher, the lady in the tourist office, the words most often used were serenita and tranquilita, serenity and tranquility. Many people talked about the freedom to play, the chance to express oneself, the importance of harmony between father and mother, but safety and tranquility stood out as the universal gifts that a family and a community could give its youngest children. As one shopkeeper put it, we need to protect them from trauma when they are young so that when the time comes for them to carry the burdens of adulthood, they will be strong. The scientists at the CDC who conducted that massive adverse childhood experiences research would no doubt agree. Make no mistake, Scano is not a children's paradise. Neither is Italy. In Italy, as in the rest of the Catholic world, revelations involving child abuse committed or condoned by clergy have shaken the faithful to the core. There are plenty of Italian families struggling with poverty and addiction, and many children, especially from gypsy or foreign families, suffer social discrimination. In my research, I visited pediatric cancer wards, children's courts, drug treatment centers, and homes for delinquent children, as well as nursery schools and village festivals. Even if an outsider were to see Scanno and childhood in Scanno as a paradise, the people of Scano would not agree. I spoke with parents and grandparents who felt that systems and politicians were failing their children. Among the system failures that provoked most complaints were the lack of a public nursery for babies under 36 months. And the fact that doctors from the national health system who run the clinic left for their hometowns at night and only emergency services were available to cover for them. People also complained about the inroads of media and technology on the traditional culture, the premature exposure of teens to sex and drugs, and saddest of all, the fact that too many young adults in Scano, on graduating from university or trade school, are forced to leave the village in order to find work. What does Scanno tell us about the role of religion in addressing vulnerability and fostering a responsive state? First, looking at childhood in Scanno through the lens of child development, it provides us with a very simple ecological diagram. Family, church, community, and school are all child-focused, stimulating and mutually supportive microsystems creating an ideal environment for mitigating vulnerability and building resilience in young children. Children's vulnerability is seen as a gift that should elicit loving care from adults as a group, not just from immediate family and parents. Children's well-being is a matter of public, not just private pride, and children are engaged actively in the life of the community. This combination of nurturing care, safe surroundings, and the freedom to explore their world is just what the doctors would order for proper brain development in the growing child. I credit the religious culture of solidarity for the willingness of all members of the community to embrace all Scano's children as their own. While I heard complaints about cuts in funding for the teachers' aides who make it possible to include even children with significant disabilities in regular school classes. No one supports discrimination against any child or segregation of any child in or out of school. Equal access to schools is considered a right of every child, including children who enter the country illegally. 
I also credit the culture of solidarity for an amazing statement I heard repeatedly. When I asked, what about the poor children? I was told over and over again, there are no poor children in Scandinavia. Frankly, I found this absurd, and I wondered why they would say such a thing. Scano is not Beverly Hills. Many of the houses would be considered substandard at best by U.S. building codes. But after a while, I understood what they meant. There might be families struggling with job loss or mental illness or divorce or other challenging circumstances. But no child in Skanna was allowed to grow up in poverty. No child was isolated because of class or race. No child ate a different meal at school or missed out on preschool, summer camp, or a school trip. Skanna folks do not see need as a form of personal or familiar, familial failure. The existence of child poverty in Skanna would be judged as a failure of community rather than as an individual failure. Images of the poor as undeserving others may show up in regional conflict between northern and southern Italy, but rarely if ever appear at the local or community level where social solidarity is a deeply rooted tradition. So far, the responsive state has remained mostly behind the scenes in my description of Scanno and childhood in Scanno. But the Italian state, through its laws and policies, has played a major role in supporting Scanno's healthy ecology of childhood. Recall those interlocking microsystems, exosystems, and macrosystems. Values of mutual care permeate the national macrosystem and shape local environments at the levels of exosystem and microsystem. Italy has an excellent system of universal health care. Prenatal care, well baby care, and pediatric care are free to all, and access to health care for adults is extremely affordable. Solidarity extends to the value of work. The Italian Constitution begins, this is a democratic republic founded on the dignity of work. In Italy, labor laws still protect job stability, pay for parenting leaves, and cushion unemployment and family tragedy. Income supports and parenting allowances may be stingy in comparison to wealthy Scandinavia, but they are generous in comparison to the even wealthier United States. The ecology of childhood is shaped by national laws in Italy mandating inclusion of children with disabilities, supporting children's nutrition, and providing allowances to large families. The pension system enables grandparents to provide loving and attentive care when parents are at work. One last statistic that might have something to say about the benefits of an Italian childhood. An Italian minor is 23 times less likely than a U.S. minor to spend some of his childhood in a prison cell or detention facility. There is one important legal fact that I have not mentioned. Italy, along with every other country in the world except the United States, has ratified the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, which recognizes children's economic and social as well as civil rights. Italy really has seemed to embrace the Children's Convention. Children's rights are taught in every school, beginning with the nursery school. They are discussed in the popular media and in daily conversation. And children's rights have come to play a powerful role in shaping Italian children's law and policy. Maybe we can thank all those paintings and frescoes of wise men kneeling before baby Jesus and all those statues of the Madonna and child for Italians' rapid embrace of the Children's Rights Convention. Sad to say, the present moment is a dangerous one for Italian children. Powerful voices are telling Italian leaders that the current economic crisis in Italy is a result of being too generous in sharing the wealth and too protective of workers and families. Critics claim that welfare democracies are unsustainable, and they blame social welfare policies for causing the markets to crash and unemployment to skyrocket. 
My comments on the fallacy of their reasoning and the role I believe was played by greed and globalization will have to wait for another day. But whether rightly or wrongly, Italian leaders are under a tremendous amount of pressure to cut programs and services. So far, they have been careful to protect the most vulnerable, and I can only hope that they will continue to do so. According to some schools of thought, Italy and neighboring Mediterranean countries suffer from an excess of familism. Familism is defined as too great an attachment to children, family, and home, leading to the failure to embrace the values of economic efficiency and rugged individualism. In my view, Italy and its neighbors are in touch with a far more ancient and fundamental value than efficiency or individual success. As most of the world's great religions and systems of ethics would tell us, the measure of a society's worth is not in the survival of the strongest and most powerful. They will always be with us. Instead, true worth is measured by the flourishing of the smallest, weakest, and most vulnerable. Thank you. Oh, I have a nice, we have a nice hopeful picture. You can now see why we're so proud to have Professor Woodhouse on our faculty. Thank you so much for a splendid lecture. I think Don Browning, uh, our <laughs> colleague. Don Browning, the uh, late great uh, dean of interdisciplinary family study uh, for whom this lecture was named, uh, would be deeply proud of this and this wonderful kaleidoscopic tour of the macro and the micro and bringing these case studies to bear in such a resilient way. Charter flights for Scano will be leaving tomorrow afternoon, <laughs> um, and I'm going to be in the first seat because this sounds like a wonderful place to be. Um, this is designed to be a conversation amongst us as we think through some of these hard questions uh, so poignantly illustrated uh, by Professor Woodhouse's lecture and the pricey uh, of the vulnerability project that she and Professor Feynman are leading. Um, so I would like to invite you to uh, engage us in conversation. Um, if I could, for the sake of the um, videotape that we're taking, ask you to come to the microphones halfway in the auditorium, or if you're pinned in your seat, uh, we can bring the microphone to you. But it would be lovely if we could have a few questions uh, from the floor uh, addressed to Professor Woodhouse. She will address the questions herself. Um, please make them questions and not separate speeches. We've had two brilliant speeches already, one by <laughs> Feynman in Bose and then one by uh, Professor Woodhouse, but please. Professor Clay. Well, I, you know, I can't talk without giving a speech, so I apologize <laughs> already. Uh, I grew up in Iowa where there's this great affection and affinity for the marvels of rural life. Yes. I felt like I was revisiting the literature of my childhood as you talked about Italy, without the, the, the mountains and the one-lane mountain roads, but uh, the sociology I heard reminded me so much of where I grew up. Uh, when you said things like nobody, no child is poor, well, in comparison to the community where I grew up, even though we were poor, we weren't poor because nobody was rich. There was very narrow range of economic uh, life in this rural agricultural uh, factory area. And, and similarly, you said things like um, there's very, no one is isolated because of uh, ethnic or religious uh, diversity issues. Well, that was true there. We were all uh, uh, of European descent pretty much, and we were all Protestants. And so no, none of us were isolated. And there are other places nearby where the public schools were Catholic schools because the whole community was Catholic. And it, so I just wonder how much you were describing life in small, rural, isolated places, and maybe if we went to Wasilla, Alaska, mm -hmm, we'd mm -hmm. find the same thing. I don't know. I'm not well, we sure might. about Wasilla. Um, pro <laughs> um, probably not as sophisticated a group of people, but we might find the same sociology. And so I wonder if what you were giving in part, not talking about the, the national policies of Italy, but your description of life in Scano wasn't really, or Scano wasn't really more a critique of small rural communities as opposed to the urban life 
with which everyone must struggle and where it is not impossible but, but impossible but very hard to recreate this kind of caring environment. No, I, uh, in fact, I'm, I'm also studying a small rural community in the United States that I think has many of the same um, characters, characteristics as, uh, as Scanno. And in many ways, uh, this is part of a larger project, a, a book project on the ecology of childhood in comparative uh, perspective. In many ways, part of what I'm going to be arguing if my research continues to play, play out the way it does, is that we could model some of our policies very well by looking at all of the things that work well in small communities and look for ways to make those same kinds of uh, microsystems and the same kinds of, uh, of supports for families, uh, transplant that idea into larger communities. Uh, in fact, that's being done in the United States today in some quite large urban communities, if you think about, for example, the Harlem Children's Zone, where in fact the, the notion that children grow up better in a, in a safe environment where everyone knows them and where there's a commitment of the entire community to them is being uh, nurtured in, in Harlem, in Manhattan, in New York City. Uh, so it is, it is not, uh, I don't think that what I'm seeing in Scano is not unique to Italy. Maybe, however, that some of the supportive policies are, are, are unique or are, 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 are worth noting. Uh, for example, the access to medical care um, and, and the notion that uh, one of the other aspects of this is the, uh, the emphasis in current um, political and economic ideology uh, worshiping mobility. Everyone should move, 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 go to the new place, uh, which may not be, frankly, so good for children. So there are aspects that are very much, uh, I, I did think Iowa. I also have to say Professor Cloud uh, led a uh, very, very interesting um, study of Methland, a book that talks about the disintegration of many of these Midwestern uh, town. So one of the things that I'm looking at in Italy and the United States is drug treatment. What happens when drugs in begin to infest a community? But yes, it's just like Iowa. Only they have better food. <laughs> <laughs> and better wine, yes. <laughs> Good afternoon, Professor, and thank you for your talk. Both you and Professor Feynman spoke about how a robust welfare democracy and a large state can help to support these local communities. But isn't there also a dark side where more centralization, bureaucratization, and politicization can undermine the community ethos, the voluntary associations, and the society's mutual aid that makes something like Scano possible? Uh, I do see that, the, that there's a potential for that happening, particularly if you have a very um, unresponsive state that tries to dictate exactly what's right for each person, that adopts policies that, uh, that are not, um, that may be easier policies to put into place but don't actually match the lives of, of the individuals. But I do think that in looking at Scanno, you're seeing a, uh, a, a community that, in spite of the fact that there's a very robust welfare state, or has been in the past in Italy, a community that hasn't forgotten or uh, had weakened its sense of connection to its own people. So I, I strongly believe that uh, a welfare state, a responsive welfare state, can very nicely coexist with individual and community, particularly, responsibility. Um, <clears throat> while you were away uh, in, in Italy, um, uh, uh, America really embraced the economic theories that were created by a novelist. Kind of an unusual thing, but uh, the novelist, Anne Rand, has uh, kind of taken America um, <laughs> The, 
it's founded by very strong research of uh, fantasy. And I wonder how you would respond to Anne Rand's advocacy of uh, selfishness. Well, I've known, I, have, I, do, I do not and did never know Ayn Rand personally. But I have known uh, her work since I was a teenager. And it's very alluring. But in my life experience and in my observations of the way the world works and in my hopes about the way it should work, uh, I, d I find it extremely lacking. Um, and that's possibly a long discussion, but uh, uh, it just, um, I guess one of the reasons I like to work at this micro level is because I'm working with, with real things and real people and real events. So, but when I encounter a, uh, a macro theory that just doesn't seem to mesh with the way life is lived by real people, uh, then, then I'm not persuaded. I don't know if that's responsive to your question. I guess with the macro theory, I understand how you nurture that because it's not really nurturing, it's policy and people voting for it and putting it into place. But with the micro theory, how do you nurture the environment in that way where people, I guess, have the same values and valuing children and things like that? Do you mean sort of how would you create that kind of an environment at or the local level? Right, or encourage it. Or not even at a small local level, at a bigger, yeah. at an urban level. I heard you talk about Harlem, and I was just I think intrigued. One of the things I, I said about the macro system was that it, it, it's like a, a water in an ecosystem. There's a lot of flow back and forth from, you know, you think of water being evaporated and then rain coming down. There's a lot of, of interchange and, and flowing between the systems. And the example I would give you from my research that is very striking is the Convention on the Rights of the Child. The Convention on the Rights of the Child was ratified by those at the top. It was brought into, the, into law in Italy, and it was um, introduced to the Italian people over 20 years ago. What I've seen in the, in the past decade or so is a real embrace of the concepts that are, are propounded in the, in the Convention on the Rights of the Child at a grassroots level. Uh, one of the nice things about this kind of ethnographic study that I do is that I can watch television if I want to find out what people really think. You know, I can, I can watch television programs. And in television programs, people talk about children's rights. Oh, play, play, that's one of the most important of the rights of the child. You see the rights of the child talked about constantly in all kinds of different settings. I'll give you an example of a conversation that I had uh, with a woman in Scano. I said, I'm here to study children's rights. And she said, oh, the children of Italy have no rights. And I said, well, tell me about that. And she said, well, for one thing, there is no nursery for zero to 36 months in our town. And there should be a nursery for children in our town for that age group. And, another, and she went and listed a number of different things. But when she thought about children's rights, she thought about children's rights in the sense that the UN Convention uh, establishes children's rights as rights not only to uh, act autonomously, but to rights to nurture, rights to be protected, rights to have uh, loving care. That has permeated the Italian social system, even, even in Scanno, which is relatively remote. Uh, and it began in some ways at the top. But I think the ways to, the project, you know, that's the project. How do we build uh, social structures where not only where people from above are telling those subjects of their laws, this is what you should do, but where there's a groundswell from the people saying, we believe it is our obligation. And I think you have that in Italy to a great extent. I'm, I, I don't know. I'm speculating now, but I do think that perhaps taking us back to religion, the Catholic Church has something to do with it. Do we need to foster religious organizations in our smaller communities? Um, 
many, many possible ways that one could go about uh, uh, identifying and putting into place these kinds of uh, responses to vulnerability. I do think that the opposite has been happening, that we've had this drumbeat of, uh, uh, well, you know, it's really unfortunate, but we can't afford to care for the needy. You know, <laughs> we can't afford to, to, uh, to be responsive to other people's needs. Uh, and we have to, if we want to have everything uh, go right, we have to start out by looking after the me, and then everything will trickle down. So I do see that difference. Professor Woodhouse, um, my question basically came down to considering the history of, immigra of emigration to other countries and the control by the Catholic Church and the division within Italy of small kingdoms and whatnot, how is the Stano of today different than the Stano of 200 or 100 years ago that resulted in you know, the lower population and people like and me people who have Italian yeah. history? Well, there's been a tremendous amount of depopulation of, uh, of the smaller, more remote parts of Italy, and that is a, an enormous problem. Uh, it's kind of beyond the scope of this talk, but I am very concerned about globalization generally and its effects on children. And uh, as we have in the ecological context, recognizing that there are certain environments that are really quite precious and need to be preserved, I, I will be, in the rest of my, you know, as, as I complete this project, uh, exploring that issue. Um, the depopulation of Italy has occurred in the past, particularly in connection with economic crisis or with wars. We're seeing that all over the globe. People who are driven out of their homes, either because of famine or hunger or um, because of civil unrest or war, how can we, how, it, it, is it necessary, is it necessary that this kind of suffering occur in order that, uh, that we um, have a global culture or global environment? Uh, I don't know, that's something that I've been thinking about a lot and I'll, I'll be looking at globalization and its effects on children. That was just great. I think she deserves a loud round of applause. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.